Good morning. Beautiful time of worship, wasn't it? Good to come and just before the Lord and grateful that His presence is here. It's with us all through the week, but there's something unique, dynamic about coming together with a bunch of other people and just with a heart that says, Jesus, you're worth it and we love you and we want to worship you. And we want to continue to worship as we choose to learn now, open our minds and our hearts and opportunity to, to look into God's Word. If you've been around for a while, you know that we're journeying through the Gospel of Mark. We actually started the Sunday after Easter in 2019. We're going to conclude on Easter Sunday, 2020, with the story of the resurrection. Uh, in January, uh, we kind of got to the part of Mark where there were, the tide had turned, so to speak, or there was a shift of direction, and Jesus was now headed towards Jerusalem. And there are a couple of themes that elevate from the stories and the teachings of Jesus in these last weeks of his life. And one of those is the idea of greatness. Back in their day and in their culture, a greatness to them meant we have a position, we have a place of power, we have a place of prestige, and because of it, we are able to cause others or invite others or demand others to serve us because of who we are and who they are, and we are above them. Jesus showed up and he said this to his followers. He said, listen, I know, that, I know how it goes around here, that the leaders and the, those in authority in this age, how they lord it over those underneath of them, but not so with you. I'm going to redefine greatness, turn it upside down, or more likely turn it right side up, because even I, the Son of Man, the Son of God, did not come to be served, but to serve. And so in the month of January, we talked about true greatness and serving and humility. Now in February, we've been talking about the idea of worship under the context of love and the greatest commandment, which is to love God and to love others. An expert of the law came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? Mark chapter 12, love the Lord your God, Jesus said, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The first two Sundays in, in this month, we looked at more of that vertical uh, part of the commandment, which is to love God. And now we're looking at the horizontal part, which is to love others. There are two ideas, two entities, but they're linked into one. Jesus said, there is no commandment singular greater than these, plural. Love God, love others, one command. You cannot fully do one without the other. In Mark chapter 10, we looked at the story of the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This rich young man had figured out what he had to do in order to achieve a financial stability and security. Now he wanted to know from Jesus what he needed to do to make sure he had a spiritual stability and security. So Jesus, what must I do? And Jesus said to him, Here's what you need to do. Go sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and then come follow me. And the reason Jesus said that to him is because Jesus knew his heart. Jesus knew the rich young man loved his stuff, his money, his possessions more than anything else with all of his heart. So Jesus said to love God, to follow me. You need to love God with all your heart. You love stuff with all your heart. Go sell your stuff, then come follow me. In contrast, two weeks ago, we looked at the story of the woman who came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume worth more than a year's wages. She took it, she broke the jar, she poured its contents over Jesus' body. The people who observed what happened, they, they looked and they said, what a waste! We could have taken and sold it, given the money to the poor, we could have done lots of good things. It was a wasteful act to them. To her, it was a worshipful act. The difference was the value, the level of worth and value they placed upon Jesus. They said, man, I, I don't know if that was worth it. She said, oh, it was so worth it, and he's worth so much more. We invest in what we value. And so the question that we asked was, what is it, that thing, that possession, that relationship, that, that entity in our life that we would say, it's our jar, it represents our jar, what is so important to us, and would we be willing to break that open and to pour it out to Jesus, say, Jesus, you, you matter more to me than this. Vertical relationship, love of God. Last week, we started talking about the horizontal relationship, love for one another. And we did so in the context of relationships in the home. Our spouses, our children, our parents, our siblings, our brothers and sisters, our, our relatives. Uh, we looked at Ephesians chapter 5, a couple of principles. And in order for us to do this, to love those in our homes as we love ourselves, 
reminder, those, word, those two words, as ourself, is what makes us really challenging. I mean, I can love others you know, from a distance much easier than loving them as myself, which often means I need to step in and engage, take action, do something, respond, show empathy. In order to do that in the context of our homes, uh, Ephesians 5, 21, submit yourself to one another out of reverence for Christ. Choose to step into someone else's world and to make their world better. Choose to lower yourself, the, 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 the truth of January's messages, choose to lower yourself underneath of them in order to lift them up in the context of the home. And we can't do that in and of our own strength. Ephesians 5, 18, we need the power of the Spirit. I and mean, we can know the good we ought to do, but it's still really hard to do it. And so we need the power of the Spirit to fill us, to move us. And so we're going to talk about those principles now in the context of the broader scope of neighbors. In this second part of the commandment, one commandment, two parts, love God, love others. And I want to look at this this part of loving your neighbors yourself from Luke's account of the story. Uh, Luke gives a, a few more details, and Luke actually shares a story Jesus tells in context to this, this story. Luke 10, an expert of the law comes to Jesus, same as Mark 12. Ask him what's, what, what's the greatest commandment. They have the dialogue about love God and love others. And then in response, uh, this expert in the law asks Jesus, he wants to justify himself, so he asks the question, he said, who's my neighbor? I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, who's my neighbor? And Jesus now tells a story that Luke records for us. Verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So Jesus starts the story with a description of a man and what happened to him on a journey he took. Jerusalem to Jericho was about 18 miles, a slight uh, decline in elevation. Jerusalem is about 2,500 feet above sea level. Jericho is about 800 feet below sea level, so about uh, over a half mile, 3,300 feet of decline. And also on that, uh, that road between Jer Jerusalem and Jericho, it was a very rugged road, uh, rough terrain, hard to travel. And it was an ideal location, an ideal spot for muggers to hang out, thugs to hang out. And, and so as Jesus begins his story and describes a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho and what happened to him, you can see a, this is a literal picture of the route. And it would be easy for muggers to, to hide out behind a corner, around, behind a rock, around a corner, and they would jump out and attack people coming by and would rob them. So much so that this, this route was referred to as the way of blood. Because of all the muggings that took place, the blood that was shed on this very route. And so when Jesus begins the story this way, this wouldn't have surprised them. They would have gone, okay, yep, heard about that, maybe even known someone who had been mugged or uh, maybe knew someone who did a mugging. Uh, this is a familiar concept to them. Uh, story continues. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side as well. So you have this man beaten, bloody, half dead, laying on the side of the road, and likely he hears the sound of footsteps. Good news, right? Maybe he's alert enough to open his eyes and, and see the individual coming, and he gets close enough and he realizes it's a, it's a religious man. It's, it's a priest on his way. Good news, surely. Uh, someone is coming and about to help me. The priest sizes up the situation and decides to pass by. Uh, Jesus doesn't give any rationale as to why the priest chose to did the, do this or why he chose to have the priest do this in the story, but uh, there would have been a couple of reasons that would have made sense to the people listening as to why the priest may have done this. Uh, it could be that he feared the robbers were still nearby, and if he chose to step in and help, it would put his life in even greater danger. He's already on the road. His life is already in danger. If I stop to help, man, they might still be in the area. I don't know if I should. Perhaps he was returning home to Jericho following a term of service as a priest there in Jerusalem. And, and he's anxious to get home. He has a to-do list uh, to accomplish. He has family members to attend to. He sees the guy beaten, bloody, not moving potentially dead, if I go over to him and I start to shake him and, hey, you, are you still there? If I roll him over, if he truly is dead and I touch a dead man, 
I'm now ceremonially unclean. I got to turn around, go back to Jerusalem, go through the rituals in order to make myself clean. Uh, Whatever his reason, they were enough to cause him to pass by. The simplest thing to do, the least costly, least inconvenient. Uh, Verse 32, another religious man comes by, this time a Levite. Levites had roles to serve in the temple. Potentially he just got done serving his role. He comes upon the beaten up, bloodied up, lying in the side of the road man. And he too takes a glance and and passes by on the other side. Uh, Again, not Jesus doesn't give reasons to it, but... Uh, for these religious people, maybe the Levite, maybe the priest, maybe both, they may have both also thought of the, the reality of, you know what? In their culture, they believed that prosperity was a sign of God's favor. And challenges and bad circumstances and difficult things that came were often a sign of God's disfavor, displeasure. Maybe this guy's been living in sin. <laughs> maybe he sort of deserved it, had it coming to him. They may have thought that. In addition, the priest and the Levite, uh, they would have most likely thought to themselves, the status situation. Those who are below us serve us, and those who are above us, well, we need to serve them. So they come across a beaten up, bloodied up, naked man lying on the side of the road, and they have no way of knowing where he stands. The way you could often tell where people stood was by what they wore. Well, this guy's not wearing nothing, so we don't know where he stands by that. You can also have conversations, find out what they believe, what their views are, how they worship, where they worship, their political stand. All those types of things matter to them, and they look and they're like, we haven't had a conversation. I don't think he's even able to talk. There was no way for them to know where he stood. So part of them may have thought, well, because we don't know where he stands, maybe he doesn't even deserve our help. Because we might be above him. In fact, likely we are above him. They pass by on the other side, unable to discern where he fits or where he belongs. Jesus continues the story, verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you have. Now, as we read this story, if you're familiar with it, we reference this man, this Samaritan, as, if you know it, say it with me, as the good Samaritan. Now, we added that phrase based on the story. Uh, Jesus doesn't reference them that way. Uh, The the heading is titled that, but those were titles given, uh, placed in there by by people who interpreted or or translated the scriptures for us. And so uh, we refer to him as the Good Samaritan, right? Now, if we would have been able to have been in that era and stood up and said, hey, man, that kind of makes him the Good Samaritan, doesn't it? The Jewish people would have had an issue with that. Samaritans uh, were despised by Jews. Uh, Back centuries earlier, uh, Jewish people had intermarried with Gentile people. Samaritans were the result. So they're half-breeds. You're not really us anymore. And those people who became Samaritans actually started to develop some different belief systems uh, they had a different location of worship, Mount Gerizim versus Jerusalem. So there, there were multiples of things, ethnicity and culture and you know, standards and beliefs and views and all those things and where we worship that, that created this great divide between Jews and Samaritans. So uh, to reference to a full-blooded Jew, this is a good Samaritan, would be kind of like me saying to you, I met someone the other day, they were a good terrorist. And you'd be like, <laughs> That doesn't go together. There's no such thing we would say as a good terrorist. They, Jews, would have said the same about a Samaritan. No, 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 no. They're despised Samaritans, not good Samaritans. Example of this is in Luke chapter 9. So just prior to the story here in Luke 10, Jesus and his disciples are traveling in the north of Israel down to Jerusalem. En route, they go through the region of Samaria. 
We're told that they came to a village. They wanted to enter the village, maybe to get some to eat or to rest, whatever it was. But the people, the Samaritan people in the village would not let them enter. They did not welcome them. Because Samaritans didn't like Jews either. They knew the Passover was approaching. The Samaritans did. The Samaritans knew that Jesus and his followers, these Jewish people, were headed to Jerusalem to worship. They're like, that's the wrong location. You worship on Mount Gerizim. You should worship here with us. This is the right way. They, they didn't like the Jews either, so they're headed to Jerusalem. So they said, no, you're not welcome here. James and John, their comment to Jesus was, should we call down fire from heaven and wipe them out? Let's order a drone strike. It'll be quick and easy, and they'll be gone. This was their reality. This was their view of each other. Multiples of translations actually use the term a despised Samaritan came along. The NIV, which I read, does not, but multiple translations do. A despised Samaritan enters the story, becomes the hero of the story, and is now known as the good Samaritan of the story. And the reason, the reason, is because he chose to live in obedience to the greatest commandment. He chose to love his neighbor as himself. And the reason he chose to do this is not because he saw something different that the others didn't see. It's not because he noticed a need and the others didn't. No, they all noticed a need. They all saw the exact same thing. The beaten up, bloodied up, half dead guy lying along the side of the road. The difference was that the Samaritan chose to do something about the need he saw. He saw a need and he stepped in and he met the need. Back in December, that was our Christmas offering theme, see a need, meet a need. It's not just a nice cliche that fits with Christmas. It's a valid principle that describes what it means to be Christian because it's the fulfillment of the greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what this Samaritan man did. He bandaged him, his wounds, poured on some oil and wine to help mask the pain. He put him on his own donkey so that road they're traversing down, much easier to ride on a donkey. He says, no, you ride on my donkey, I'll walk beside. Brings him to an inn where it says he cares for him. We don't know how long, but for a period of time he cared for him, met his knees, helped him to begin to heal. Samaritan man had to leave. And so he goes to the keeper of the inn and said, hey, listen, this guy, I brought him here. I've taken care of him for a while. He's in no condition yet to travel or to leave. He needs some more days of rest. Here's some money to pay for that. I will return. And when I do, if he stays even longer and needs extra attention, I'll cover all the expenses for the care required. Samaritan chose to step in and to make this man's world better. He chose to enter his world to make his world better. One of Martin Luther King's last sermons preached before he was killed was on this story of Luke 10, the Good Samaritan. As he preached, he pointed out the difference of perspective that was had between the priest and Levite and that of the Samaritan. And I think the way he described it is extremely profound and dramatically practical. The priest and the Levite, because of their perspective, they asked this question. If I help this man, what will happen to me? If I stop to help him, what will it cost me? What danger will I be in? How inconvenient might it be? What might other people's view of me be as a result? If I stop to help this person, what will happen to me? The perspective of the Samaritan caused him to ask a question as well. But his question was this. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Oh, that's profound and dramatically practical. How easy it can be for us to say, I think at times, well, I'm, man, I'm, I'm a priest, not a paramedic. This guy needs medical care. <laughs> What could I do? I'm a construction worker, not a counselor. And this person, man, they need some emotional and psychological and relational and spiritual help. They need guidance that I couldn't give. Or flip that around. I'm 
I'm a counselor, not a construction worker, and the, the, the need that they now have, man, it requires hands-on. I, I'm not very, ha- I don't know how to do that kind of stuff. Hopefully they'll find someone who can. A person needs help or care or attention, and, and I think at times we can think to ourselves, a reason why we might not love as ourselves, love a neighbor as ourselves, because we think, I don't know that I'm qualified, or maybe I'm too busy, or I don't have enough skill or enough competence, or I don't have enough resources to truly step in and, and help. There are people who are trained for that kind of thing, people with the right skill set to meet those kinds of needs, people who get paid to deal with situations like that, Right? And so at times, I think a reason that we might give ourselves of not stepping in, not choosing to meet the needs that we see, not choosing to love our neighbor as ourselves, is because we choose the incompetence excuse or the busyness excuse. And then I believe there's other times when we might not step in to help because we simply choose the unwillingness excuse. They're different different background they have a different upbringing i don't quite get it they have a different color they have different views of life of politics they're a little too liberal over there they're way overly conservative over there they have different sin issues you know i mean theirs are just they're, they're evident and they're obvious and man they need to man i, I i'll pray for them I work hard for a living, and it's apparent that they don't. Maybe someone else will help, but I don't know that they deserve mine. Because of our differences, we can actually tend to lower the value of the other person and therefore quantify whether or not we believe they are worthy of our love and care and help. And we can even justify our lack of love and care and help because of the differences that we see. Jesus seems to be saying through the story, especially by him interjecting the life of a Samaritan to be the one to do good, that this is no longer to be an excuse. That our neighbor is to include all. That we are not to assess whether or not they are worth it by whether or not they are different. We are no longer to look at someone and say, what will this cost me? But we are to look at them and say, what will it cost them if I don't? The principle of the greatest commandment. Choosing to show love to our neighbors, to all of our neighbors. No longer about what it might cost me, but about how it might benefit them. So back in the day when I was a youth pastor, we used to play this game. It was called Who's Your Neighbor? Anyone played this game? It's so fun. I mean, some of you probably will want to do this as a small group or something at some point. It's just a good game. So everyone gets in a circle with a chair. One person has no chair. They stand in the middle. Everyone else gets a chair, and they turn those chairs facing in, inward. And then the person in the middle goes up to someone, points at them, and just says, uh, Who's your neighbor? One, two, three, four, five. And that person has to quickly state the first name of their two neighbors before the person in the middle gets to five. It's a Joe and Mary. If they do not get out the names, the first two names of those people, they now switch seats and a new person is in the middle and they point to someone and ask the same question. If the person does get out the two names, Joe and Mary, before the person in the middle gets to five, then a second question is asked. Do you love your neighbor? The person then has the option of what to say. They can say, yes, I love my neighbors. If they say that, then every single person has to get up and find a different chair, at least two chairs away. And in that process, almost every time the person in the middle finds a chair, usually the chair of the person who just got up in front of them, and someone else is now in the middle. But the person has the option to say, no, I do not love my neighbor. Then a third question is asked. Well, then who do you love? And now they have... uh, options of what they want to say. They could say, I, I love everyone who is wearing glasses. I love everyone who is in the 10th grade. 
I love everyone who has two or more siblings, you know, whatever they want to say. And then everyone who that is true of has to get up and switch chairs. And again, everyone's trying to get into a chair. And then it repeats itself over and over. Let's think about that game in the context of real life. Question number one, who's your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? There's value in knowing your neighbor. And taking time, expending energy to get to know your neighbor. In the game, I guess the greatest value is simply to know their first name so that you don't have to end up in the middle. But in real life, it's not just about knowing a first name, it's about building relationship. It's about getting to know one another. It's about placing yourself in a position where you can See the needs that are around you. Because sometimes they're not as evident as a beaten up, bloodied up guy on the side of the road. Sometimes they are. Many times they're not. Because we often try to hide and cover our needs, don't we? But yet we have them. And so getting to know your neighbor, who's your neighbor, is an important part of being able to live out the greatest commandment of loving your neighbor is yourself. I wrote this down. My neighbor is everyone and anyone that God brings into my path who has a need. Anyone and everyone that God brings into my path who has a need. Now, this doesn't mean that every single need I become aware of is my responsibility to meet. But it does mean, I believe, that every need I encounter is a potential opportunity that I could meet. As I get to know the people around me, my neighbors, it includes, as we talked about last week, those in my home, my spouse, my kids, my parents, my siblings. They're my neighbors. My neighbors includes my literal neighbors, the people who live next door. There's Mike and Lydia, and there's Dave and Marie, and there's Brian and Natalie. and They're around me, and you have neighbors around you too, literal neighbors. It includes unknown strangers that we've never met before, whom we happen to encounter. And we might not know their name, but we might have a chance to get to know them because we see a need and we could step in and meet it. This includes people who are different than we are. Maybe from a different town or a, a, a different team or a different school or from another office or from another church or from another, another you know, political view or side or religious view. Or, all sorts of differences of, that are found in people. Who is my neighbor? It includes all of them. Every single one. To the Jew, it included the Samaritan. To the Samaritan, it included the Jew. This was turning their world upside down. They'd be like, oh, we've got reason not to love them. She's like, no. Who's your neighbor? It includes all. Second question, do you love your neighbor? It's one thing to know them, see a need. It's a whole other thing to act upon that need, which is what it means to become like Jesus. I don't know about you, but I know for me, it's often way easier. To walk by. Just is. I mean, I don't know if I'd truly be able to bring much help. At times, I don't know if I feel like bringing much help. I mean, that would be costly. It, It would be inconvenient. It would infringe on my desires and agendas. And so, uh... It's just easier. It's easier to disengage. It's easier just to watch TV. It just is, right? It's easier to engross ourselves in our own worlds, our own needs, our own issues, our own desires, than to step into someone else's world and their issues and their needs and their desires. It's easier to rationalize some things away. Surely they have a relative who will help. Um, I I don't know if they truly deserve my help. Uh, Whatever it might be. Sometimes it's easier just to walk by. But Jesus is saying to us that that's not what it means to be a follower of his. He says, you follow me. You love God. You love others as yourself. I want to close this morning the same way I closed last Sunday 
with an invitation for each of us to think about uh, one or two small practical changes that God might whisper to us, even in these moments, as to how we might need to change. Of how we could love our neighbors in a, in a deeper way, a more significant way, a more biblical way, a more Jesus kind of way. And maybe that's through an attitude or maybe it's through an action. Maybe it's through both. When it comes to your view of or your treatment of your neighbors, what is one change of action or one change of attitude that God might ask you to make? And maybe it's towards an individual person. Maybe it's towards a group of people. And then there's this, this idea, this definition of a vector. A vector simply means, here's my trajectory, I'm headed this way, and I'm going to make a small shift, a small change, and as I begin to head that direction, a week down the road, it might not be overly obvious, but a month, it will become more clear, and within a year, it's going to be like, people are going to look at my life, and they're going to say, there's something different about you. You know, I, in fact, I, you used to, like, I thought you always viewed that other school, or that other you know, political party or the other ethnic group. I always thought you viewed them negative. In fact, I heard you say things that made me believe that you believed negatively towards them. But I don't hear that from you anymore. Something's different about you today. Or maybe you would say, I don't really think I am negative in speech or actions towards people or groups. But maybe you're neutral. And God would lead you to no longer remain neutral, but to step up, step in, and say, I want to engage that person or that group or that, whatever that might mean. I want, I want to make their world better. I don't want to just uh, not make it worse. I want to make it better. I'm willing to step into their world to make their world better. This can certainly include, you know, one-day events and projects and things like that, Absolutely. Certainly, uh, you know, all day Saturday service project or whatever can be, it can be a very practical application of this. But, man, it, it's not limited to like three Saturdays a year. This is to be like, a, this is my mindset all throughout the year. This is who I, I want to be as I go situation to situation, relationship to relationship, person to person, need to need. This is who I want to be and how I want to live. And again, we need the Holy Spirit to transform us. I need the Holy Spirit to transform me to do this, to be like this. Because we can know the good we ought to do, but struggle to be willing to do it. But God says, man, um, when you made a decision to follow Christ, I, I sent my spirit. I put it in you. All things are possible through Christ who gives me strength. Jesus continues the story by asking the expert of the law a question. He says, verse 36, which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, well, the one who had mercy on him. Notice what the expert in the law did not say. He did not say, oh, it was the Samaritan. In fact, let's give him a new name, the good Samaritan. <laughs> Maybe Jesus meant nothing by this, but likely he did. Uh, uh, Jesus didn't say it. Likely the, the man, maybe the man meant nothing by his re response, but likely he did. Likely his view of the Samaritans was that they were so despicable that he did not even want to say it was the Samaritan. He just said, well, it was the one who showed mercy. Jesus responded, and he said, go and do likewise. Jesus' invitation to the expert in the law, Jesus' invitation to everyone listening in then and to everyone listening in now, is that we would observe the story of the Good Samaritan and then we would go and do the same. Fulfillment of the greatest commandment. Because of my love for God, I love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I now choose to love others as myself. God, we invite you to just speak to us in these moments. And God, I know that this is, man, this is so practical. And I think it's so clear in, in many ways. Lord, some of us, maybe we just need to have our eyes open and we really don't see needs around us. I think many of us do see needs and, and our question is just like, do I really want to? Do I have the strength to? Am I willing to, to, to sacrifice to? Um, God, I pray that you would just work within us even now, even in these moments, God. Transform us into your likeness. 
Jesus, we're so grateful that you chose to do this for us. You're the, you're the ultimate good Samaritan. You stepped into our world. You saw us beaten and bloodied and uh, spiritually speaking, we were lost without a, without a way. We were sinners without a savior. And you came and you stepped into our world. And as a result, you did become beaten and bloodied for us. It did cost you a lot. But you loved us not only as yourself, you loved us more than yourself. So, we're so grateful for that. Help us to model you. We're not just trying to be like a Samaritan here. We're trying to be like you, Jesus. And so fill us and empower us and and show us how and where and who. In Jesus' name, amen.